and welcome everyone to this webinar on reward and recognition. Just to set the scene as we, we move into this webinar, a little bit of time to reflect. Um, I want you to think about what the brand of safety is like in your organisation and why. Uh, is it perceived as a business enabler? Uh, are teams and leaders eager to have safety conversations, share learnings and provide feedback? Or is it perhaps perceived as a necessary evil? Uh, do leaders and team members see safety a bit like the Brussels sprout on the, dinner, on, on the kids' dinner plate? It, you have to eat it to get the ice cream, to get the job done, but if you can, you'll, uh, you'll feed it to the dog. My, my experience with it, so many organisations is that safety is that necessary, well, it's that compliance thing we have to, we have to do uh, in order to keep the regulators or the board or whoever off our backs um, uh, so that that brand is, isn't as strong as what it could be. As we're going to see as we go through this uh, particular webinar is that having a strong reward and recognition program in relation to safety and understanding how reward and recognition can empower and enable and energize people to, to engage more proactively with safety can be a real key in unlocking uh, some of those, uh, some, some of the better or more helpful frames around safety. So looking forward to sharing some of those ideas and insights with you all. As Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, our mission is to change the lives of individuals and organizations for the better every day. We do that through the application of psychology and neuroscience to improve uh, organizational uh, capability. So we, we give uh, great organizational insights to enable you to, to build your safety strategy and we help to develop leaders and teams and, and do some process improvement work as well. So jump on our website and check us out if you want to know more. We've provided some accompanying result, uh, resources to today's webinar. So if you uh, would like to understand more or you want to have some takeaway points, I really recommend that you download that resource. It's a cracking resource. Um, and again, gives you some really useful prompts and, and ideas and, and tools to support the recording and, and of course the slide deck that you receive. We're gonna to tackle today's agenda in four steps. Firstly, we're gonna look at the effect of safety leadership. So we've got some really interesting insights to share from our own safety leadership across, across the globe. Uh, our own safety leadership research, sorry, across the globe. We're gonna look at what are the current insights, the common pitfalls that we see organizations make and we're going to chat a little bit about what good looks like and some of the practical strategies that you can put into place. We'll kick off by having a look at the effect of safety leadership. Now, we spend a lot of time talking to organisations about safety leadership and leadership as a whole because it has such a huge impact on all aspects of your organisation. So, as you can see here, this is our safety culture model and it says that our organisation's safety culture is made up of four key components. Environment, so it's your environment, uh, practices, design of equipment. Uh, so your environment is your physical environment, uh, including your design, your engineering, and your equipment. You've got your practices, which is your policies, your procedures, your rules, your guidelines. You've got individuals, so that's people's attitudes, skills, capabilities. And around that model, very purposefully is leadership. Because leadership has such a huge impact on not only what is put into place within those other three dimensions, but how effectively uh, they are implemented. Because you can have all the systems and processes in the world, however, the person component may not engage with them. So the role of leadership is to make sure that the environment pra practices are set up to support individuals to make the right choices and that individuals are encouraged and empowered to be aligned with the company's strategy around safety. When we talk uh, or tap into safety, we look at uh, these eight dimensions of safety. So these are transformational and transactional uh, leadership, com safety leadership competencies that we've pulled from the literature uh, to help organizations make sense of the skills that a leader needs to be able to, to drive a positive safety performance. So we've got supporting, recognizing, active care, collaborating, vision, inspiring, role modeling, and challenging. The definitions are there on the screen. And of course, they're in that handout. Um, Quick question for you. If you were to think about the role of leadership in your organization and how effective leaders are, and I'll ask Sarah to, to put this poll up on the screen if she can. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to think about how many, uh, in your organization, what percentage of leaders do you think demonstrate strong safety leadership? So do you think it's less than 20%, 
20 to 40%, 40 to 60%, uh, 60 to 80%, or do you think the majority, more than 80% are effective and strong safety leaders? So a bit of a, bit of a reflection question. How effectively do you think your, your leaders lead safety within your organisation? So I've got those results rolling in now, which is great. We'll give you another couple of minutes to respond. How are the response rates looking there, Sarah? It's very good, 94%, so I think great. I might. <laughs> we'll close that out, perfect. Yeah. We'll see what we landed on. Okay, so some interesting results. So a lot of people fell into that middle bracket. So the 20 to 40 or 40, 60%. So 66% fell between 20 and 60% uh, of effectiveness, 16% less than 20% and 6%, three people uh, said that more than 80% of their leaders were effective safety leaders. All right, so that's interesting data because uh, it's useful to compare to our own data that we've we've collected over the last few years. So we've collected upward safety perceptions of safety leadership leaders uh, in, in a recent study uh, where we looked at uh, over 8,000 participants. And we basically asked them, how did they view uh, the direct leaders safety leadership abilities? So the, the industries we covered out of interest are agriculture, manufacturing, mining, oil and gas, industrial services and utilities, and they're from uh, full locations, so Africa, Australia, and, and a more global sample as well. And what the study found is that only about 24% of leaders demonstrated a strong safety leadership perspective from the perspective of the people that they led. So that equates to about one in four leaders. So in most organisations that we work with, it's a real perceived gap of the workforce. So they look at their they look at their own managers, they look at their own direct leaders, and that that belief that they're not such strong safety leaders themselves obviously will have a commitment on their own behaviors. So we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more. Another quick poll for you, just as we jump into this next session section. If we focus specifically on that idea of reward and recognition. How would you rate your ability to recognize and reward your team for safe behavior? So this is a self-reflection question. Do you think it's poor, average, fair to average or strong? So do you think it's something that, that you don't do very well and probably possibly don't think about very much, you, you, you're okay at or something that you're, you're very good at and you're very conscious about? Where, where do you think you land in that, in that sample? All right, so we're collecting that data now. How are we looking, Sarah? 80%. So give another minute or so. So what we're gonna unpack once we get this data is uh, those eight dimensions of safety leadership and where reward and recognition sits in relation to uh, perceived capabilities. So the survey's come in and about nine people have self-reflected and, and really challenged themselves and said, um, look, probably not great. We're, we're pretty poor at that. About 41% uh, say fair to average and about 41% say, say strong. So thank you for those bits of feedback. Interestingly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one in four leaders are perceived as effective or strong safety leaders. But when it came to reward and recognition, what we found is that overall, most people viewed their leaders at pretty poor at, at recognizing positive safety behaviors. Um, so we thought, all right, well, that's the overall ranking. Maybe there's different slices and dices. Maybe, maybe this is an industry skewed sample or source. Maybe if we went to a different industry or a different area, it might be different across different industries. So we unpacked it in relation to industries. And what we found is, recognizing again came out as the most significantly poor performer. Then we thought, all right, well, maybe it's a tenure thing. Does tenure have an impact? Again, recognizing in relation to tenure, significantly lower than the other competencies. So again, this is people ranking their direct leader. Um, we then looked at company, um, yeah, so yeah, company tenure, uh, also, same thing. Recognizing came out as as one of the one of the weakest ones. We put that on top of the fact that 
more participants rated their direct leader in the red zone for recognizing than any other competency. So time and time and time again, when we've run these surveys and we've got this data, people feel that their leaders aren't effective at recognizing their positive safety behavior. So what this says is that only one leader in 10 will regularly reinforce safety performance. This is from the perceptions of the people that, 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 they, that they lead. We then looked at this data and we looked at to how it compared to the drivers of a positive safety culture. That's again, another more recent study we did with, a, with about 20 or 30,000 sample group. And what that found is that one of the, one of the key challenges for organizations who are stuck at the lower end of the maturity curve, so this is counterproductive or private compliance safety. So these are cultures that really see safety as a barrier to getting the job done. And it's very much uh, leaders having to drive safety and, and, and drive compliance. What we found is that in these cultures, one of the poorest performing areas or one of the biggest factors contributing to their underperformance was employee safety performance. So employee safety performance refers to how much people feel appreciated for the efforts that they put into safety. So what this is saying is that, th that there's a perception from these people that it doesn't matter whether they engage in positive safety behaviors because no one pays attention to it or recognizes it. And in fact, if you dig a little bit deeper into this data, typically people feel that like they only hear from safety when there's something negative coming through. So I can do the job 99% of the time safely. Uh, I can do all the things right, um, but they only, but if I get something wrong, something gets broken or, or I get injured, then look out, uh, all hell rains down. So this is a, a serious challenge for a number of organizations because Imagine being that worker. Imagine have a, having a workforce where you feel that safety is only something that is focused on when something doesn't go to plan. Uh, it's, it's a significant challenge culturally, and it means that uh, safety will be perceived as very much a thankless kind of job. This is also typically reinforced by other common pitfalls which organisations have. And one is recognition programs that are tied to KPIs. Um, and Often these KPIs are considered without the, uh, are put into place without the consequences of them being implemented, being fully understood. I've got a typo on there, apology. Um, so often these KPIs are tied to production goals. So often that will, will drive a win at all cost mentality. Organizations will then, largely driven by boards, uh, be wanting to drive down their lost time injury frequency rates or, or injury rates. So then they might tie a particular, another financial incentive to an organisation to say zero harm or, or reduced injury frequency rate number. So you've got a challenge here where you're, you're rewarding high levels of production and you're rewarding potentially people not not getting hurt, or that's that's what they're trying to achieve. Um, so that that there's a strong focus typically on those lag indicators. And look, it sort of makes sense. Oh, you know, if you want to improve something, reward it. But the challenges, there's a heap of challenges that come out of that, and a lot of those challenges come to come out as the the accuracy and usefulness of the type of information we get around safety. So you're much more likely to uh, to bury those safety incidents or injuries if we're not recognising or rewarding the same things. And and obviously over time uh, that can have a significant impact on your safety performance and your exposure to risk. Uh, the other challenge we'll see a lot of organisations or the other pitfall we'll see from a lot of organisations is the vague that the vague praise and recognition. So leaders feel like they need to say thank you for things, but they're not specific enough with the types of things that they're trying to reward. So as opposed to going out looking for positive safety behaviours that reduce risk, that they might just thank people in general and they might not be thanking people for the right thing. So they're not specific enough with their praise. And we'll talk a bit more about how to do that in a moment. Uh, often, uh, and this ties back into the first item a little bit, the focus is heavily on recognising outcomes rather than behaviours. And yeah, with production pressure being a challenge, you can see how this plays out. I mean, imagine if there's a supervisor um, called John, he supervises a team of operating operators, um, operating machinery in a material, mineral processing plant. 
a vital piece of equipment has stopped working and John is feeling the pressure from management to get it online ASAP. He sees his team members work over time, create a band-aid solution, and they get the equipment up and running and they're seen as the heroes. Even though John is aware that his team didn't complete a job hazard analysis for the task and actively chose to use tools on the task for which they were not designed. So he gets praised, he then passes the praise down the line. Although not intentional, John is rewarding his team for cutting corners and taking shortcuts. He's praising risk-taking behaviours. And while no one was hurt in this particular instance, it doesn't mean that something won't go wrong next time. And in fact, if people have been rewarded for those positive behaviours, it is actually more likely that they'll do that again. Uh, it is more likely that they'll want to put themselves in that hero position. But if something does go wrong, what happens? What is the output? Uh, and and what, what, what is the pain that that particular person experiences? And then finally, uh, recognition not being fit for purpose. So uh, a one size fit all approach. So even if there is a reward recognition scheme in place, even if there has been thoughtful analysis put into uh, rewarding the right types of things, often the rewards don't actually match uh, what they're trying to achieve with people. So they're not meaningful enough for people to buy into them. Um, so we'll, we'll chat about some of those common pitfalls and how to address them in, in just a moment. But I'll ask you a quick question. Which of the common pitfalls do you think represent the biggest opportunity for your business? So I ask Sarah to drop this poll up on the screen, great. So is it uh, recognition, recognition programs tied to KPIs, praise for praise sake, recognizing outcomes rather than behaviors or a one size fits all approach? Where do you think the biggest opportunity sits in your business? All right, how are we looking, Sarah? We have 70% um, voted, so we'll just give it a few more seconds, a couple. More seconds. All right, okay. Great, well, uh, we'll have a look at these results. Right, okay, so you can see the strong tie between the recognize recognition programs tied to KPIs and recognizing outcomes rather than behaviors. So they, they take up the biggest chunk and there is a relationship that we can tie between the two. So recognizing outcomes rather than behaviors is by far uh, the biggest challenge that organizations are identifying. So that's useful to understand and that's definitely something we're going to unpack as we go through the rest of the webinar. Thank you for your input. Okay, so what does good look like when it comes to reward and recognition schemes? And, and what are some of the factors to consider? I'm gonna kick off this part of the section by unpacking a little bit of the neuroscience of, of what motivates and energizes people. Um, the first part here refers to how the brain interprets threat and reward. Um, so our, we have a, our brain will, will perceive physical threats and uh, rewards in a very similar way to social threats and reward with that pleasure and pain kind of response. So um, David Rock's done a lot of work and research into the concept of the social brain for those who'd like to, to dig a little bit further into this. But what it basically says is our brains will be either uh, through social interactions with people will be either rewarded or threatened. Um, think about this from, a, from your school perspective. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to get selected for a team and the way they selected the team was they lined all, all the potential players up against the wall and they selected two captains uh, and they got, got you to pick out one person at a time. Uh, if you've ever been in that experience, you'll know what it was like to get picked first. It was a little bit of a fist pump and I sometimes run this, this activity with executives and, and leaders across different organisations. Even adults in that scenario, knowing it's a game, get a little bit excited. But then think about if you've ever been the person left to the end of that game. You're maybe in the last three or four people. What's going through your head? How are you feeling? What are the emotions you're starting to experience? Uh, how does that play out in terms of your physical physical symptoms? Even adults I see in that experience, 
when when debriefed on that, the common thing they're thinking is, please don't be last, please don't be last, please don't be last. That necessity for us as humans to have a social connection to other people is very, very important. And this is important to understand when it comes to our brains and reward and recognition around safety. When I see my leader approaching on a safety interaction or a safety conversation or whatever the case may be, what part of my brain is being activated? Is it a threat or a reward response? Because our brains will have a frame about the type of experience that is. And that is gonna be triggering different neurotransmitters within our brains. It'll either be triggering stress hormones, cortisol and those types of things, or alternatively, if we get it right, as we can see in the next item here, it'll be triggering dopamine and serotonin, which trigger reward and happy types of chemicals within our brains. And these are chemicals that help people feel more motivated uh, to achieve goals and drive towards particular outcomes. So it's important to understand that, that the perceived interaction and the actual interaction that you have with your leader is going to trigger very real chemical and electrical responses from within the people within people's brains. What also happens is when you're triggering a reward response within people's brains, when you're triggering dopamine and serotonin, you feel a deepened social connection with it, with the person that you're having that experience with. If you're having a positive interaction with someone, if you're having something that's helping you feel that happy and reward type of chemical, your, your, your feeling of connection to that person is going to increase. As opposed to if you're having a threat response triggered and you're having uh, that cortisol type of stress chemicals released, uh, you create a very different type of experience and, and, and very much less of a connection with that person. The other thing to recognize here is that small acts of gratitude can trigger the feedback loop and create that reward experience within people's brains. So in fact, many small acts um, regularly can be as effective or more effective than big acts over time. So there is a very real brain experience that happens when you engage in ineffective or effective reward and recognition practices with people. Another layer of, I guess, reflection uh, for you all is think about if you've got a behavioral based safety program within your business, you know, do you go out and you, you follow those, those documents, you know, eyes on task, you know, pinch points, you know, equipment, all those types of things. What are they geared towards? What is the purpose of those particular tools? And what sort of brain responses is that heavy? Or is that experiencing or triggering within the people that are that are that are being audited or or, or being observed, as 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 they say. Our experience at Senison, certainly my experience, is that's not typically a, a fantastic experience for the person being observed. Firstly, you look at the design of those tools, uh, and we're going to chat about this uh, in just a moment. They're all geared towards it's either safe, tick, no conversation needed, or it's at risk. And if it's at risk, we need to have that conversation and we need to implement that corrective behaviour. Think about, as you're out there, communicating, walking around people, how many good, positive safety behaviours and acts are you walking past or are we walking past as leaders in order to get to those negative or perceived negative interactions? And what, would that, what impact does that have from a, a behavioural psychology perspective? Because... Behavioural based tools are based on behavioural psychology. And what behavioural psychology tells us is if you want to increase the behaviour, reward it. If you want to decrease the behaviour, punish it. If you want to extinguish a behaviour, ignore it. And what we're seeing through the research and the data and everything that we're getting through is that uh, negative safety behaviours are generally punished, but often um, positive safety behaviours are entirely ignored. So again, the way these tools are designed and our mindset around how we engage with our people around safety and those small incidental interactions has a huge potential not only to drive a divide between uh, team members and leaders, but also again, continue to tarnish that brand of safety. 
So some considerations uh, as, I, as I progress past that point. So, so one consideration is to think about what you link um, your reward and recognition strategies to. So our challenge to organisations is to move beyond focusing on KPIs as being your key reward and recognition strategy. A lost time injury frequency rate, those types of things, they're done. You know, once you've got that number, they're, they're done. And what you're actually asking people is to, to do is to focus on the absence of something, to focus on avoiding something. We're not empowering people as to what they can do to positively impact on creating a better and safety place, better and safer place. So linking recognition to the vision and behaviours, uh, the vision, values, and, and we'll talk about values and how you can pull behaviours out of values and key objectives, safety priorities, give people something much more tangible to focus on. And it gives us an ability to move the safety conversation from being a negative conversation, avoiding something negative, to a positive thing, putting more positive things into the workplace environment. So we'll, we'll unpack that in just a moment. I'll talk to you about setting positive and negative or lead and lag indicators in just a moment. The next one here is learn what motivates your people. So think about what is it that's gonna get the best bang for buck out of your recognition schemes for your people. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways that we can, can approach that that we'll talk about in just a moment. The next one is building recognition skills. So leaders, even if they want to recognise people, often aren't very effective at it. So uh, we need to give them those skills. And then this ties a little bit to probably the first point here and potentially is find ways to integrate recognition into your existing workflow and practices. So we'll, we'll kick off this little section by having a look at the idea of linking um, uh, linking recognition to company vision and values and objectives. And we're just using our own examples here uh, because it, it's our IP and we're, we're enabled to do that. But we've seen a number of organisations do this well. Enabling people to recognise, oh, building out behaviours, very clear behaviours that tie to values is a very useful tool. Uh, it's a very useful tool because it sets a set of expectations about the way we do things around here. But then tying reward and recognition to those behaviours in a way that enables peer to recognise peer, leaders to recognise team members, team members to recognise leaders, is a great opportunity to start to foster and drive values, a values-based organisation, but to make reward and recognition an everyone activity. So. That's one example there, but what we'd be encouraging you to think about is, what are the behaviours when it comes to safety that if we did more of, we, we're, we're pretty confident that it would result in, um, in a reduction in our lost time injury frequency rate. Sometimes we see organisations look at safety improvements. Sometimes organisations will link it to their infield interaction and, and the quality of those. And we'll talk about how you can do that in just a moment. But as, we, as you think about what those behaviours and objectives could look like, think about the idea of the lead and lag metric conversation. Now, this is a really sticky one and people have a real difficulty getting their heads around lead and lag indicators because they get stuck in semantics and, and, and it's an imperfect practice. In some ways, what you're doing is you're hypothesising that these behaviours at the front end are going to impact on your indicators at the lag end. But, but stick with me for a moment because I think there's some useful tips here to think about that can, can solidify your thinking about how to approach this a bit, a bit better. The first point that we want to touch on here is don't get stuck in the debate of whether measuring things that have already happened, example, safety conversations, are lead or, lead or lag metrics. It's, I think, shift the conversation to be more about positive, things that you want to increase or see more of versus negative, things that you want to decrease. So if you think about lead indicators as being positive things that you want to see go up, that can often make the conversation be a little bit easier because people get stuck and they'll say, all right, well, we're gonna measure safety conversations, but if the, if the data is not completely live and you know, if we're not getting it instantly, is it really a lead indicator and can we, so people get stuck, get, they get stuck in that. But what we're looking at is we're looking at 
Now, if safety conversations is one of the critical drivers that we believe is going to build our safety culture and ultimately get ourselves a better outcome, that is a indicator that's a positive indicator that we want to see trending up. So it's about so sometimes challenge yourself to think about positive and negative uh, versus uh, lead and lag, if that makes things a little bit easier. Um, if you're thinking about tracking these metrics, um, think about what your current metrics are, what's already been tracked and measured. Uh, and it might be sometimes about refining some of those as opposed to creating entirely new metrics. Uh, if you are going to roll out new metrics in an organization, just do one at a time. Keep it, keep it, keep it as simple as possible. The more of this you pile on, the more of a, the more of a challenge it becomes for organizations to think about lead, uh, lead and lag indicators and, and they get stuck. Take some time to reflect on what the metric means and what, what would change if it did or didn't improve. Uh, metrics should drive action. So, you know, if, if you saw more people in field, more leaders in field having conver safety conversations, what are the, what are the um, proposed changes that that's likely going to have? And how do we believe it's going to impact on the lag indicator? And then if we don't see it impacting, like what are the timeframes we'd expect that to be having? And if it, and what are, what are we going to do if it doesn't work out? So keep an eye on them, keep talking about them, draw meaning from those metrics, as opposed to just having them sitting stagnant up there on the wall. Uh, the next one is think about, as you're setting up your metrics, how they're going to be measured. For example, um, how are you going to measure the quality of a conversation. Um, there are, there are two different tools that you can use to do that. And then finally, uh, again, something that people often miss when they set these targets is how are you going to keep up to date with the score? How are we going to know if we're winning or losing? What makes a game interesting to watch is in fact the score. And the funny thing about a sa the safety game is the, the team that wins scores the fewest points. Uh, I can't think of a game where it's about um, not scoring goals. Um, where if, you're, if you've got positive safety behaviours that you can focus on, or sa positive safety actions that you can focus on, it enables us to keep count and you can know whether you're winning or losing that game. We've got some examples of lead indicators here up on the screen that you can review. We've got a dozen of these. But again, a lot of these tie down to uh, what are your key safety strategies within the organisation and, uh, and what are your key objectives. So a couple of considerations there. So positive versus negative uh, is sometimes an easier way to think about uh, building the focus as opposed to uh, uh, lead and lag. Learn what people, uh, what motivates your people. So what this refers back to is um, making sure that whatever reward and recognition we give is meaningful to people. And this is where, again, leaders get really stuck. Surely uh, people, every, there's an assumption made often that you know, money is the major driver or the major motivator for people. But in fact, uh, our experience and research indicates that there's lots of ways that people like to be recognised. Uh, and if you're stuck as to what the best motivator or, or bit of recognition for people within your workforce is, there's one great way to find out, and that's to talk to them and that's to ask. So they don't necessarily have to be a tangible thing. You don't have to give out a Waco fridge freezer or a $100 gift voucher to reward and recognise people. It can be actually career development opportunities. It can be opportunities to share your ideas, your innovations with the executive team or other parts of the business to progress careers. Um, it might be giving them an opportunity to run an improvement project. It might be, um, there's also social opportunities here. So there's been some awesome research into um, reward, reward and recognition schemes that focus on organisations making donations to agreed uh, charities and, and third parties and people going out and seeing the impact of their donation and, and their hard work on, um, on, these, on these charities or on these less fortunate people or situations. So again, sometimes it's, it, there's, there's rarely one silver bullet when it comes to reward recognition strategies, you might have team strategies that focus on social outcomes. You might also set in uh, individual pieces that you discuss with, with team members based on what they're trying to achieve in their, in their outcomes. But it's understanding your workforce, talking to them and, and asking them where the biggest bang for buck is, is really powerful. And again, what we encourage you is move beyond thinking that tangible monetary 
uh, rewards are the only way to do it because there's a bunch of different ways to reward and recognise people. The next item we spoke about or we, we identified as an opportunity for many organisations and many leaders is the actual skill of giving recognition. Um, so we talk at a high level about two basic skills when it comes to giving recognition. One is tokens. So how do you give a in the moment unit of recognition or acknowledgement and then there's attribution. So that's sort of like a token on steroids. That's beefing it up so that people take on, take on that outcome and that behaviour um, more long term. So a little bit, of, little bit of detail about this. A token uh, is simply uh, a, a moment of recognition, a piece of recognition in a time. In order for these to be best and most effective, follow these principles, uh, follow one or, or all of these principles. Well, one no brainer is obviously it needs to be genuine and honest. Uh, people's brains have a very good lie detector. So if it's not genuine and honest, if you can't make it genuine and honest, a suggestion would be don't bother at all because you do more damage than good if it's not genuine and honest. Make it data-based. Um, a data-based um, token is based on a specific thing that someone has done, i.e. They, if they completed a job safely, you could focus on the specifics within that job that they did safely to get to that safe outcome. Just saying to someone that they're a safe person um, or you know, they're a good person, not maybe okay in your personal relationship, saying I love you to your wife, that's a, a non-data-based token. But when it comes to your workforce, making them data-based, uh, it, it makes it more effective and, and more targeted as to the thing that you want to see more of. So the more data-based tokens you give, the more effective the, the input. Think about whether you do the recognition privately or publicly. So some people love to be recognised publicly. You know, stood up, you know, this is Jessie, she's done this great thing. We all clap, we applaud, it's great. But then other people put in the same situation will, will wither. up. So then they'd much appreciate being taken aside and having a quiet pat on the back. So think about whether you do it privately or publicly, person to person. Uh, third party is another really useful way to think about giving tokens. So a third party token is passing on a piece of recognition from someone else. So I could say to James, who's my, my colleague on the call here, that, hey, James, Sarah and I were having a conversation and uh, Sarah mentioned that she thought you're a really professional operator. Well done. So what I've done in that moment is I've passed on some recognition from Sarah that I've reinforced that in my own. So again, it just gives that token a little bit more oomph. And then the last one is time. You can't underestimate a leader's time as a token. So as you're going out in the field, having conversations with people, spending undistracted, 100% focused time with a person tells them what? It tells them that they're important and that they matter. So put your phones away, stop looking at that behavioural based tool and ticking those boxes or whatever the case may be and just connect uh, with the person. So these tokens uh, are something that we're going to really challenge you to think about handing out and they don't have to take a lot of time. You can, uh, you know, they can take a second or they can take 10 minutes. It depends on how you want to roll them out. But just understand that they can also be positive and they can be negative. Of course, uh, if you give someone a negative third party interaction. James, I was talking to Sarah and she said, you're doing a rubbish job. Uh, they will also have an impact. And in fact, negative interactions will often stick with people for much longer and much harder than those positive interactions. Think about driving your car. Um, probably not driving it as much with COVID at the moment, but if you're driving home this afternoon, you'll probably have someone let you merge. There'll be someone else sort of wave you in to something as you're coming off a side street. You can have a bunch of positive safety, a bunch of positive interactions with people on the road. But as soon as that one person cuts you off, what happens? What happens with your drive home? It's gone from being a potentially pleasant drive to one where you're, there's all sorts of words potentially flowing from your mouth, depending on what sort of driver you are. This is a challenge. When we're chatting to our people about safety, when we're in field having those interactions, the things that are going to trigger people's threat response, the things that are probably going to stick with people, unfortunately, are going to be those negative interactions. They're the things that sting. And what makes them sting even more is if people feel like it's unfair. If they feel like, hey, well, yeah, you, you're having a crack at me about that, but 
I've done about 50 other things that you haven't noticed and you've walked past. And in fact, I was doing this the other day and you walked past me and you didn't say a thing. So thinking about your token economy and beefing up the positive ones helps not only change the brand of safety, but create a different type of relationship with your workforce. You want to look at a ratio of at least four to one, five to one of positive versus, versus negative tokens. The next item to think about is this token on steroids concept. So this is um, attribution theory. So attribution theory talks about giving a person an internal cause for an external outcome. So it, it, it ties to language such as this, because the type of people we or you are as a result of your, or due to the choices we make. Um, so an example of this would look like this. This team has been responding to challenges so well because of the flexibility and collaboration you have shown in the face of adversity. I believe this reflects the type of people we are. Now, what this has done is it's not only recognised the behaviours that we want to see more of, is we've given them a reason why. The reason why they're able to, to perform in that way and, and respond in that particular way is because they're the type of people that are flexible and collaborative. So we've actually put a frame or an attitude in someone's subconscious about the type of people or the type of person they are. And these frames can be incredibly sticky, particularly when they come from a person in a position of authority. And you will have these frames in your subconscious from being a child right now. You're probably just not consciously aware of them. Uh, as a North Queenslander, grew up, I grew up fishing. And a frame that still sticks with me it's been up a uh, sand fly infested creek in North Queensland and mosquitoes are about to carry us away, but we're catching fish. My Uncle John's on the nose, my dad's in the boat, I'm about five or six. And the, the mosquitoes are so thick, they're in your nose as you breathe in, but the fish are rolling in. And my Uncle John, I think, had, uh, had about enough of the mosquitoes, but a slightly less intense fisherman perhaps than my father, and said, look, Mark, I think we better move. Little Anthony's about to get carried away by mosquitoes. My father responds to John, quick as a flash, says, don't worry about him, he's a tough little bugger. So the frame that he'd put in my mind at that point in time is, I'm a tough little bugger. What was the chance of me whinging after I'd best been given that attribution by my father? Well, I'll tell you, I didn't whinge and I muscled up and geez, I was itchy that night. But these frames can stick. So using this uh, is a very useful skill uh, for leaders to reinforce the attitudes and behaviours they want to see more of. The next and final item to consider is find ways to integrate recognition practices uh, into your existing workflow. The first thing I'm going to really challenge leaders to think about if you've got a behavioural based kind of process in place is review that form. Um, I'm, I'm really yet to see one of those forms that really is that positive. You may, have, you may be better at it than the organisations we've worked with and, and that's good for you. My challenge to you would be, is there a place on that form that encourages your leaders to hunt the good stuff? As they're going out there, correcting behaviours and looking at, at, at at-risk stuff, is there a prompt and a recognition and data collected about the good things that are happening? Um, Again, you can have those conversations. They don't need to be time consuming. Um, so think about that. Think about um, how else you can integrate into other daily rituals. Do you have existing start a shift meetings? Is there an opportunity to recognise workers in, the, in that space? Is there an opportunity for team members to recognise one another? Uh, because again, creating the opportunity for peers to recognise peers uh, in those safe environments can be can be as powerful or even more powerful than it coming from a leader. So again, we're not suggesting that this reward and recognition program has to be an entirely new thing you overlay in your business. Often when we work with businesses, it's about understanding, well, what, what do you currently got in place and how do we tweak it a bit to make it more impactful and more brain friendly? Okay, so uh, just, just drawing to an end here, a couple of things to think about uh, for your toolkit. Firstly, um, identify the positive safety behaviours you want to see. So rather than focusing on the things that you don't want to see, what are the things that you do want to see? Uh, make a list of the types of recognition that are available, talk to your workforce and get really clear about the best way to tap into those dopamine reward loops. 
spend time in the field, talk to your team, look for opportunities to reward, reward and recognise. When you observe positive behaviours, consider uh, what they would value most. Actually do it. Reward and recognition schemes only work if you do it and you put them into place and they're genuine. So a couple of things to think about uh, and, and I think definitely uh, take those, those ideas back and look at, well, what have you currently got in place and how do we tweak them a little bit to make them, to make them potentially more impactful. The data that we drew from for today is available in these two resources. So you can just go to our website, centers.com.au forward slash insights. We've got a bunch of studies there based on our experience with so many organizations across the globe. So I'm gonna open up now um, for a couple of questions. So if you'd like to hit, hit Sarah with those questions, I'll give those a few minutes to, to roll in. Um, just while those questions are, are coming through, a couple of offers for you. Uh, we've been running this intensive leadership program. It's a whole new way to think about leadership development in response to COVID. It's six times 90 minute sessions with supporting resources and it basically takes you through an intense consolidated safety leadership program, looking at everything from defining safety culture through reward and recognition, psychological safety and trust and planning out your safety culture evolution. The perfect program for anyone looking to build their own safety leadership skills or looking to become a safety leader influencer within their organization. So we've run four or five cohorts of this so far, you get 12 to a group. And some of the, the feedback we've had has been amazing, not only in relation to the content, but it, it's also been really positive because the fact that you get to spend time with peers um, from other organisations chatting about what's worked well and not worked well. So it's about fostering that sense of community and idea, idea sharing across businesses and individuals. So this is something that you might be in, interested in participating in. We've got a couple of sessions running in October. We've got, a, uh, we've got one that caters for our Australian New Zealand market, one that caters for our overseas market. Hit yes uh, in the question panel up there. Um, and James Nivo will be in contact with you just to, to see to give you more detail and, and to explore, explore your interests. So if you're interested, feel free to click yes there. Just while we're waiting for that to fill up, we've also got the uh, Zip Essentials Psychology of Safety complimentary trial. Um, so Mike, we'd like to close that one up, Sarah, or let, when you're ready. Uh, we'll go to the Zip Essentials. So this is an online version of our Cognitive Behavioral Based Safety Program. Uh, so this is a flipped classroom experience. So you do the learning online at, at your own pace and we've got application workshops. So again, a huge response to this as a result of COVID. Uh, uh, it's been a, been a bit of a revelation for so many businesses because of the reduced time out of field. So feel free uh, to get in contact if you would like that. So hit yes on the screen. So I'll leave that open for just a moment. Sarah, have we had uh, any questions come through? All right, so um, Wayne has said, there, there's some of them are more like statements, um, but Wayne said one of the pitfalls indicated is one size fits all. When you have multiple sites across the country and internationally, what would be the best way to have training and to standardise on how to provide positive feedback on safety activities? Yeah, good one. Okay, so um, when I'm talking about one size fits all, um, I guess I'm, I'm often talking about leaders not thinking consciously about what they're trying to achieve out of that conversation. So um, those, those are tokens and attributions tools. Look, there's a lot to be gained. So many organisations can make huge, huge gains um, in just giving their leaders the skills to be able to recognise effectively in the moment. Now, one thing I didn't mention that I should have is Recognition is most effective when it's given immediately as something's happened. So the more time that, that goes on, the less the impact um, often that, that recognition is going to have. So giving leaders the skills to move beyond, oh, thank you and good job, uh, to thank you and that's a good job because and it's a result of and, uh, and setting them up for success is, is so important. Again, you can build on that by looking at your systems and your processes. So giving opportunities, maybe in your pre-starts, your toolbox talks for, for peer recognition, uh, <coughs> pardon me, and looking at it um, uh, as part of your infield interactions process. The other part is the behavior piece. So you know, one thing you probably do want to standardize across your organization is a certain set of behavioral expectations. So I'd be challenging you to think about, well, in the first place, do your leaders have the skills to 
have a meaningful positive interaction? Do we have the system set up that encourage them to do that? Uh, is there an opportunity to create those peer on peer examples? Um, and uh, yeah, make it, make it linked to, to behaviors. You probably have some autonomy with multiple sites across the globe to give the sites some, some budgetary um, ability to do their own versions of what the actual reward looks like based on the region. But I'd be, I think you can standardize what you're going to reward on and the systems that you implement that recognition in. That's my response to that, Wayne. Okay, so um, Wayne has also said, I have found using a positive, negative, positive safety talk with workers, that is acknowledge positive actions people are undertaking, provide feedback on how to improve a negative situation and then finish off with a positive reflection. Yeah. I uh, look, okay, um, Wayne, there's a bit of, uh, with all due respect, um, in Australia and, and in the sites that we work with, there's a name for that style of recognition. It's generally called the poo sandwich. So you've got the white and fluffy stuff, the brown stuff, and then the white and fluffy stuff on the outside. Um, and that was been a management skill taught many, many moons ago. The challenge with having a, a process where you say something nice, you give the, the not so nice stuff, and then you say something nice um, is that it actually erodes trust over time. So as soon as you say something nice uh, to someone or you're giving some positive recognition, what's going on in someone's head? They're going, all right, well, where's the bad stuff happening? And that's what, that's what hijacks the entire conversation. So my encouragement would be, if you're having a positive interaction with people, yeah, use it. we've got a method called straight talking, um, you know, be, be open and honest, treat people like an adult. If you need to have a, if you need to address something with people that is an underperformance or they're not doing well, again, don't beat around the bush. If someone's not performing, I'd be saying, hey, Barry, I need to have a conversation with you about this issue um, because I'm concerned that it's not hitting the current standard. Ask a question, get more data because you, you don't have all the data um, and, and see it as an interaction uh, and, and more of a conversation as opposed to a one-way interaction and then get a commitment if required to do something different. So I would wane um, with all due respect, uh, you know, the, the positive, negative, positive, uh, there's a lot of research to suggest uh, and, a, and a lot of personal experience to suggest that's probably not going to get the desired outcome. All right, thank you, Anthony. We don't have any more questions now. Um, I've been getting a lot of good feedback via email though, so that's great. And um, I just want to let everyone know that there, the handout that um, Anthony has been referred to, it is, um, there's a link in the chat and a link in the Q&A and there'll be another link coming in the email as well. Um, and also we've got a, a, a link just in here for a survey. Um, if it's, it's just like, a, 30, 40 seconds, but it, if, if you can fill that out about these webinars so we can get an idea of the sort of information you're after. And um, Anthony, do you have anything further you'd like to say? No, look, um, I'd just like to thank everyone, whether you're listening along or you attended today, I think, I, uh, thank you for taking the time to think about reward and recognition in relation to safety. If we want to move the dial from safety beyond compliance and beyond uh, a perceived big stick by management to, to a more positive organisational enabler, this is a conversation that needs to happen. Um, so uh, feel free to hit me um, via email or on my um, LinkedIn account, Anthony Gibbs at Centus, if you want to discuss or get any more details. All right, thank you very much for joining us, Anthony. I know there's an, an, a couple of other webinars coming up in the next two months with um, Centus. Um, so I'll, send, I'll put a link in the chat for those and they'll also be in the email later today. And I've also just included a link to the continuing professional development CPD points that we're um, offering with these webinars for um, alongside the Australian Institute of Health and Safety. So um, with that, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, have a great rest of your day and thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Take care. Okay, bye.